I think it's become something of a tradition to have you close with Fiel Can. Awesome. I don't know. It's like you like the main act. Glad to keep you all from the uh, beer, which may even be showing up as we speak. That's the pandering again we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. It's so um, you're also joined by Chris Rogers, who's over here, and he's going to supplement your talk with something I think a lot of us are very excited about. Yes. Uh, so Chris is going to show the cool stuff, and I'm going to try to get through the boring stuff as quickly as possible. Um, so you're a humble guy, Ken. Take it away. Thanks. Okay, so um, how many of you heard about the, or are familiar with the security advisory that came out about WebGL recently? Show of hands. All right, well, uh, probably expected it. It hit the, the tech news media. Um, let me just adjust that. Okay, so the security advisory, there were, there were two things in it. One was um, the denial of service issue, and the second one was cross-domain image theft. Okay, these were the two main uh, highlights of the advisory. Now, the fact is that the advisory contains no new news. The denial of service issue is something that has been uh, uh, brought up in the WebGL working group since the group's inception. And as a matter of fact, the security advisory actually pointed to a test case that is checked into the Kronos WebGL source tree. So they didn't even write their own test case showing the problem. They pointed at one that we have. Um, and solutions are being developed and actively deployed, including the GLR robustness extension to OpenGL, which is a, a great step forward for, from the standpoint of an OpenGL app that wants to deploy untrusted content uh, on, on machines. Um, GLR robustness has already been deployed by some of the GPU vendors and is being deployed by more and more. Um, the cross-domain image theft issue is one where the theory has already been discussed on the public WebGL mailing list. Uh, the, the basic idea was that you can use a shader, uh, a WebGL shader, to determine, uh, to, to run longer or shorter depending on the value, the color value at a given pixel. And with that secondary, that side channel information, you can actually determine what the contents of an image are that you're not supposed to be able to see the contents of. Yeah, and I see some, some laughter and yes, you know. No kidding, this really works. Um, not very reliably though. So if you run their proof of concept test case and wiggle the browser window around a little bit or do any other activity on the machine, the extracted image that they're picking out quickly degrades into noise. But you know, the fact is that you can actually infer some information. So th the proof of concept that, the, that that team created did highlight the need for some changes. So what were the responses to the issues? So the response to the cross-domain image theft is that HTML, the HTML spec already supports cross-domain resource use. Um, there's a, a spec called CORS, cross-origin resource, uh, resource share, no, yeah. cross-origin resource sharing, I think. And, um, and basically the idea is that the server, the web server, decides whether or not the client is allowed to use the resource in a cross-domain way. So what was done... In, specifically in response to this issue on request of the WebGL working group was that the WatWeG, which is the steward of the HTML spec at this point, actually updated the HTML spec, ding, in like a day once we had said, all right, look, here, here's this issue. They added core support for the image tag, for the video tag, and the audio tag. So now what you can do is when you instantiate those tags either from JavaScript or in your web page, you can say, when you make the request to the web server for this thing, please use a course. Uh, style request. And then if the server supports it, it'll give back the appropriate headers which grant the web server use of, of the resource. So then we updated the WebGL draft spec and we disallowed the use of cross-domain media entirely. It's just not safe for WebGL to be able to touch resources that are coming from other domains. But the way that the, um, the, way that the core stuff works is if the server says yes, okay to use the resource in, from a different domain, then the, the, the way that it's done is the origin of the resource is rewritten to the origin of the document. So there is no cross-domain access at that point. So it all works out, it's, it's really great. So applications, WebGL apps, can basically regain the ability with one new line of code to, to fetch resources from other servers. Um, assuming that the server actually supports cores. Now, I'm happy to tell you that we've already been working with the Picasa team here at Google, and Picasa now supports cores already. And we are working actively with other hosting sites to enable it, and we are beginning to do evangelization and you know, uh, blog posts and stuff. And so as much as you all can, as WebGL uh, users and developers, I would definitely encourage you to uh, evangelize this to the services that you use and, and express the need for it. Okay. 
So how did we respond to the denial of service issue? Um, again, GLR robustness is the lowest level solution to this problem on, on the majority of platforms. It's already out there. The web browsers, including Chrome, are beginning to incorporate that support so that it, it's really robust. Um, we are developing new extensions building on GLR robustness to basically limit the side effects of a GPU reset. Okay, so that w limit the side effects of what a bad WebGL app could do if it, you know, submitted a whole bunch of work to the GPU and caused it to go away for a long period of time. Now, in terms of robustness, in terms of actual, you know, memory safety, the, the WebGL spec now much better defines the behavior of what happens if you index an array out of range. And it's not always possible to prove that such accesses are going to be in range, but we can rewrite the shaders on the way in in order to guarantee that they cannot access uh, indices out of out of the valid range. So the angle shader validator has been improved already in this area and more improvements are coming. And the, the last updates that have been done are minor things to event handling and context creation attributes and the like. So we are aiming for a 1.0.1 release of the WebGL spec and conformance suite and I can say soon. We don't have a, a specific deadline but we'll we'll submit it to the ratification process as soon as we can as soon as we're convinced that the conformance suite is uh, passable on all platforms because there were bugs in the 1.0.0 conformance suite that is out there which is going to prevent any implementation from really passing it and we really want implementations to be able to say get context of WebGL instead of get context of experimental WebGL but we can't you know do that until we can claim that the implementations are actually compliant okay so what are the the upcoming plans for the WebGL spec the, the number one thing on my uh, plate is we're going to prototype an extension to render an HTML DOM subtree as a texture, and then you can render it in your WebGL scene, which basically means you'll be able to take a piece of your web page and stick it in 3D and move it around and texture map it onto 3D objects and interact with it. There are already some extensions out there in sort of the 3D CSS domain that let you do this, but it's an output only medium and the essential thing is to be able to actually interact with it. So we're gonna solve this problem. The project is funded at Google for the summer. We have a bright intern coming in and uh, we're all gonna work pretty hard to try to get this out there. It'll be discussed on the public mailing list, so please get involved. We'll, uh, we'll talk about what the API design will look like. We do not have a concrete plan for that at this point. Uh, typed array spec. How many people know what the typed array spec is? All right, a few. All right. Basically, this is a, a level underneath WebGL, but it's how WebGL submits its data to the graphics card. The 1.0 spec of the typed arrays was ratified at the Kronos face-to-face -face in Bremen this past May, so we finally have like a an actual spec. There is active development ongoing on the public forums in uh, public web apps in particular right now and also on the public WebGL list and also on the WhatWeG mailing list. The, the basic idea is to support bulk data transfer between the main thread and workers. Number one hot issue. This will let you do large uh, uh, model loading in the background. This will let you do mesh generation in a background thread effectively and post these results to the main thread. It'll let you multi-thread your mesh generation and assemble those results on the main thread and upload them to the graphics card. I am really psyched about this. You'll even be able to do, say, physics in JavaScript effectively and send those asynchronous results back to the main thread for display. Very excited about this. Um, we, I think we have a really nice uh, uh, proposal at this point. So that's coming along. Now, so that, that's sort of the spec side of things. Now, what's been happening in Chrome? Um, I've submitted something like two change lists in the past three months. So I personally haven't been doing very much, but the entire Chrome GPU team has been doing a ton of work. Um, a lot of work has gone onto frame rate stability, animation stability in the browser. You really want to be able, if you have a simple scene, there's no excuse for not getting 60 frames a second all the time. If you drop a frame, that's really not acceptable. It's acceptable if the application is doing a ton of allocation of garbage and you're forcing the, the JavaScript engine to do tons of garbage collection. But assuming that you're smart about that, there's really no excuse for not hitting that, that nice stable frame rate. So that's what the, the entire team really has been focusing on. And a lot of progress has been made in Chrome 13 and more is being made uh, in top of tree. Um, the, the core support for images that I talked about before is fully implemented in WebKit. I'm very happy to say thank you immensely to Adam Barth and Nate Chapin for doing all that work in plumbing. Um, I mean, I, I would give them a standing ovation if I could. Um, and the latest builds of Chrome actually enforce the same origin restriction. Um, this patch landed earlier this week and then got reverted and then I checked it in again yesterday. So the um, point is that these restrictions will be enforced in Chrome 13 and as soon as they are being enforced, we're gonna start to really you know, 
again, broadcast that, evangelize it, put up blog posts, explain the reasons for it once again, etc. Um, Angle. So Angle is the library that Chrome and actually Firefox both use in order to run WebGL on Windows. It translates OpenGL ES2 down to direct 3D calls. Now, there have been a ton of changes in Angle recently. Number one is the Transgaming, the, the company that started the Angle project uh, in cooperation with Google, has implemented Vertex Texture Fetch. Who knows why this is a big deal? All right, at least there's a few out there that understand why this is such a big deal. The, the basic idea is that it allows the mesh to be deformed in the vertex shader based on texture inputs. Um, let me show you a pretty cool demo here. Uh, what do I have to do to... Okay, here we go. So check this out. This is a physics simulation that is run on the GPU. Yeah. All right, so th this is a wave simulation done by Yevgeny Demidov in somewhere in Russia, I'm not sure exactly where. And um, the entire simulation is run on the GPU. It's run using WebGL, it's using floating point textures to represent the state of the simulation. So he's using the, the uh, uh, OES texture float extension to WebGL, which is now pretty pervasively available on like all WebGL implementations, all platforms. He uses that to represent the, the state of the waves and every, every tick, he takes that texture and renders it into the next one, uh, which you know, does the, the simulation based on velocity and, and current position, et cetera. And then he takes that texture, which basically contains the height values of the waves, and loads it in the vertex shader, and then deforms a static mesh based on those values. So the idea is that you can do GPGPU -GPU simulation already in WebGL today. Um, this data is never touched by JavaScript. So it's super, super fast. You're doing like hundreds of mega flops uh, and it's, it's really super fast. And now this kind of stuff runs on Windows in Chrome thanks to the great work of the team by Transgaming. So, um, you know, I, I can't personally thank them enough. So that is, um, whoa. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't know if you guys saw that, it's super cool. All right. Yeah, I know. Okay, so, okay. Um, so my colleague, Zhen Yao Mo, is in, in the process of updating Angle Shader Validator. He's adding an ESSL backend. This, this, it's easy to say, but this is a really super powerful, powerful change because this means that all incoming WebGL shaders are going to go through this, this translator, this validator. They're already validated, but they're not translated on every platform, even on ES2 devices, which means that they're always going to be rewritten according to some set of rules. This is a really big deal because it, it allows us to always have a gate by which the shaders can be, as best as possible, guaranteed to be secure. And uh, Mo also has implemented the long identifier handling that is required by the WebGL spec. So we're really, really close to being 100% spec compliant in Chrome. Um, and finally, there are some awesome typed array optimizations that have been showing up in Chrome 12, 13, and will be showing up more in 14. The new crankshaft compiler for the V8 virtual machine now directly supports typed arrays. Before they were handled, uh, handled using handwritten assembly code, now the compiler actually understands their semantics. Uh, this is thanks to Daniel Clifford and many others on the VA team. This is awesome because it's a lot faster, and there are some benchmarks that run more than four and a half times faster than manipulating float32 arrays in JavaScript. So this enables you, in, as a JavaScript developer, to manipulate larger and larger meshes in real time. So for example, um, this demo that was originally produced by NVIDIA many, many years ago, okay, this, this is one big mesh that's, and the entire mesh is being, is being uh, generated by JavaScript every frame, okay? You can see this amazing frame rate. We can come down here. It's running at like 40 frames a second, generating over 7 million vertices per second in JavaScript. How about that? Whoever thought we'd see the day? All right, so thank you. Thank you to the V8 team for making an awesome engine and, uh, and it's only gonna get better. All right, so now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Chris Rogers, who will take over the rest of the presentation and show the really cool stuff. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I'm Chris Rogers and I've been working on the web audio API over the last uh, about two years um, in the WebKit project and we have an implementation in Chrome and also, um, we have a uh, working version in Safari, although it's not shipping in Safari yet. And um, 
the idea of the web audio API is to add more advanced uh, audio capabilities um, that really haven't been available on the web platform up to this point. Up to this point, we've had um, the audio, the audio tag and the video tag for, for streaming audio. And there's been flash audio, but um, it was the goal of the web audio API to create a, a game, game engine um, system that would be really easy to use with JavaScript, um, but also an API that would let you build musical applications. Um, so I'm not going to go over the API itself in detail, but I'm just going to today show you a couple couple demos that interact with WebGL. Um, so let me let me show you first uh, a little bit about for the background. I have another slideshow here. So design goal is to be able to play a sound now and to play it quickly. If you if you press a key, you want to hear the sound with as little delay as possible. Um, so that's pretty basic. Um, also, be able to be able to do some fairly significant and interesting audio effects without having to get down into uh, low-level audio DSP code. Although you can do that if you want to. Um, another thing is performance. Um, being able to render very complex audio scenes without uh, causing problems with uh, frame rate in the the graphics. You don't want the graphics to slow down at, because you're doing a lot with the audio. Um, should also be responsive, like I said, respond to playback of sounds on a really short moment's notice by, by uh, pr pressing a key or mouse, mouse click. Um, it should be scalable, um, run on a variety of different hardware from really low end to high end. Um, should be modular, able to grow into the future. So, these are the design goals that I've put into this API. Um, mix sounds. Of course, you have to be able to mix sounds. It should have effects that are available in today's basic audio applications and game engines, um, dynamics compression, um, ambience reverb, room simulation, panning, spatialized panning, that type of thing. Um, and also to be able to do um, sequenced events, time-based events, to where you, you can schedule very complex audio events to happen in perfect time, sample accuracy, fade-ins, fade-outs, filter sweeps, that kind of thing. Um, and basically, um, I've put the features of modern game engines into this thing. So you can do spatialized panning and um, do convolution reverb, which basically means you can record the sound of a real acoustic space and make it sound like you're in that space. And that's the type of technology that's used in uh, console games, like if you play Portal 2 um, or games like that where you're in these giant spaces and you're moving around. You have, you, you have the sound of these immense spaces and that's done through uh, convolution. 3D spatialization as you move around sounds should move around, of course. Um, this is basically simulating the rooms. And you can also simulate other kinds of acoustic spaces other than rooms, uh, like caves, um, forests, outside spaces, hallways, being inside of a closet, being underwater, uh, the sound of a telephone, Doppler shift. Sounds get further away, they get softer. Um, sound cones. So with sound cones, if you have a sound that's pointing right at you, um, it's going to be louder than if the sound points away. Obstruction occlusion, if a sound goes behind a couch or something like that, it's going to get more muffled sounding. Or if it goes out, out uh, the door and around the corner in a hallway, you still hear the sound through the, through the door, but you want it to get more muffled. Um, so yeah, I mentioned before, if you have a game like, I'm going I'm to show you this demo in a little while, uh, this pool game. If you have a game where there's a lot, a reasonable amount happening with the graphics and there's physics being calculated in JavaScript, you don't want the, the animation to get more choppy. 
latency, press a key, sound should play back right away, not half a second later. Shouldn't glitch. Glitching is another performance issue. If you're rendering a really complex audio scene, you want to make sure that there aren't gaps and clicks and pops in the audio that you're rendering. Um, so these are just some different approaches and stuff. I'm going to get just get down to the demos because I think the rest of this is not really so interesting. Okay, so I have no idea how any of this is going to sound on the sound system because this is a sound system really uh, for voice reproduction, not for music or anything else. But uh, I'll give it a shot and see what it sounds like here. I had this dream where I was lying on. So this is a sound unprocessed. Sort of a round this is through patch a of grass. I had this dream. Through a where telephone filter I was lying on through a comb filter effect through a warehouse space that's a living living room sound um, one month ago this week, BP's Deepwater Horizon. One month ago this week. One month ago this week. One month ago this week, BP's Deepwater Horizon drilling rig exploded off Louisiana's coast. I'll try um, a backwards effect, which takes a while to build up, so we'll have to wait a couple seconds. So this is something, these demos are all up live, and you can try them in Chrome. Um, it sounds better in a good set of headphones than on, on this system, but you get the idea. Um, here's a demo. I had this dream. Which is a visualizer. And Ken, on. Ken um, actually wrote most of this. This is a round patch of grass. This is doing a real-time... Um, Sort of analysis of the summer of the of the voice and show, it's and showing all of the bit, um, um, the harmonics of the voice and and there are some different views you can the do a sounds that I heard waterfall display like that were that of a kite that was blowing in the wind and had some about three tails hanging down from its center and they flapped like <laughs> okay uh so I'll try the the pool demo that I if I can okay got a network connection So um, you can uh, shoot this pool hole here. You can zoom into the, the pool ball. Yeah, let me turn the volume up here. I don't think I can land a ball, but. And and you can try you can try this demo yourself. Um, I'm just going to hit the ball really hard. I'm not going to try to land it. And. Uh, The last demo I'm going to do is 
was made by this uh, company called Dynamo, and they um, they combined the 3.js 3.js uh, library with the Web Audio API, and um, created a really really fun, basic but fun little um, music music uh, drum machine type of thing. So I'm going to pick a color over here and you can move it around while you're playing if you want. You can choose a different, um, different sound quality. If you have any questions about the web audio API, um, you can either ask me, um, see Rogers at google.com, or you can uh, sign up for the W3C audio mailing list and um, uh, check out how the progress on the spec is, is moving along. Um, it's currently necessary to go to about flags to enable the web audio API feature. That restriction is very soon going to be taken out, probably within the next um, four to six weeks, I would, I would guess. Um, so that's all, if you have any questions. Very cool. So you can ask other questions, of course. Um, yeah, well. I won't have to walk very far. There you go. Hi. Um, just uh, curious if where this is at in terms of cross-browser stuff or what's going on with the other browsers in this space. There, There's a W3C audio group, which has recently, within the last couple months, been created. Um, my specification is, is a specification that we've been looking at in the W3C audio incubator group over the past year. Um, I'm hosting... The specification on a Chrome site right now, but I've been invited by the W3C just in the last couple of days to move that to the W3C official um, Mercurial repository. Um, I should say that the API is still a proposal. It's, it's being discussed, so it hasn't been implemented um, by Mozilla, but it is, it is working in Safari, and I've had several meetings with Apple, and they were actually um, involved in the design of the API itself. So Apple is very supportive of it. We're still trying to convince Mozilla to implement it, so those discussions are still ongoing in the W3C group. Do you have support or do you plan support for a proximity audio effect? Um, proximity? Yeah, where based on the position of the camera and the layout of the scene and whatever's making sound that the um, volume and bass is different to sort of simulate a more realistic environment? 
Yeah, absolutely. I didn't actually demo, none of my demos really showed that off, but um, the API is modular where you can, basically you have these boxes that you can connect together and the boxes represent different processing modules. And so um, one of those processing modules is, is a spatialized panner. So if, if you're listening through headphones or stereo speakers, it does uh, spatialized panning from left to right um, use, using uh, what's called HRTF, impulse response is actually recorded from real human ears. If it's playing back on a, a multi-speaker setup, it would render, say, on a 5.1 in the, in the rear speakers. Um, as far as uh, making it sound more muffled, if it's pointing away and that kind of stuff, there are filters that let you tweak that very, very specifically and add environmental effects. You could mix in more room effect, for example, if you're further away. If you get up really close to somebody, um, you're probably going to mix down the room effect and get the direct sound um, a, a little bit higher in the mix. But all of that is possible in the API. Uh, just a quick question for Ken. Um, regarding uh, using parts of the, the DOM as a texture, um, were you s implying that uh, you would keep the, the liveliness of the, the, that part of the DOM? In other terms, it, would, uh, would, uh, would that part keep doing whatever it is it, do, it does uh, normally? Yeah, yes, that's definitely the intent. Okay, thank you. Yep. Quick answer. Any other questions? Up here. One minute. So going back to the security issues that we discussed earlier, has there been any thought on Chrome's side as far as like forcing a trusted uh, situation with WebGL where content has to be first trusted by the user? So we, um, in the working group, we've discussed this at length and we definitely don't want to be in a situation where you have to click to start because even that single click, it, it's very unwebby. You know, the web is, you go to the, the page, you see the content running. That's really the paradigm. Um, now, that having been said, uh, there has been thought to uh, extensions in Chrome, for example, which can you can have a manifest that grants you more permission upon installation. So the user has to grant you a certain permission, and then you're you're granted those whenever you run. And um, the intent, and already you can get like broader cross-domain uh, uh, privileges in your app, and so the intent is to not break that. And if we have broken it in the top of tree builds, we absolutely want to know about that. But you know, the hope is that uh, we haven't. Um, in terms of getting that capability more broadly on the web, that we don't have a model for at the, at the present time. Okay. The questions. Okay. Thank you, guys.